Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast from Altos Research. This is the show where we talk to real estate industry insiders and experts about the trends shaping the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. If you follow along with Altos Research, you're familiar with our weekly real estate market video series. With the Top of Mind podcast, we seek to add context to the, to the discussion about what's happening in the market from leaders in the industry. Each week, Altos Research tracks every home for sale in the country, all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all the changes in that data, and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. People desperately need to know what's happening in the housing market right now. And so if you need to communicate about this market to your clients, to buyers and sellers, to go to altosresearch.com and just book a free consult with our team. We can review your local market and teach you how to use market data in your business. All right, let's get to the show. So it feels to me like American housing policy is making tectonic shifts, slowly changing from the 20th century to the 21st. Everyone knows we have affordability problems and policymakers seem to me like they are starting to take note. For many years and so much of this country, housing policy was aimed at like blocking development. And the question is, is that finally changing? These are uh, complex issues, and I'm interested in understanding what's happening and also what's best for America, like for Americans now and for in the future. So today we're talking housing policy with Salim Firth. Salim is a, a senior research fellow and a director of the Urbanity Project at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. His research focuses on housing production and land use regulation. Salim is one of the foremost experts on these big challenges facing the American real estate landscape. So he's published numbers, scholarly journals, uh, testified before state as well as the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Salim has a Ph.D. in economics from the University of Rochester. And so we're talking housing policy today. Salim, welcome to the show. Mike, great to be with you. Great. Uh, okay, so I like to start with your background so that the listeners, you know, know where you're coming from. You tell us about your work, you and your work at Mercatus at GMU and then the the Urbanity Project. Tell me, give me some background. Yeah, absolutely. So Mercatus is a university-based research center at George Mason University, which is a the largest public university in Virginia. We're just in the D.C. suburbs, Arlington, inside the Beltway. So we're very policy connected. We're, we're kind of bumping shoulders with the people who are talking housing policy at HUD and in the White House. But we honestly work a lot in my project more with the states and cities around the country. And, and I'd say, you know, in the time that I've been there, I, I started six or seven years ago. And I thought, well, wasn't it nice? They're letting me work in this kind of like quiet backwater of, uh, you know, zoning reform and housing policy. Nobody really cares about, but I think it's important and interesting. And uh, lo and behold, we went from having an issue that was relevant in, you know, California, New York, Boston, to an incredible, you know, I wouldn't say quite nationwide, but uh, covering at least half the country at this point where people say housing prices in my city have always been normal, they've always been within reach, and they suddenly feel out of control. And a lot of times that's actually precipitated by cost refugees from California or New York moving in and bidding up prices uh, relative to what the locals can afford. So we're getting interest from you know Arkansas, Florida, Texas, uh, Montana, places that five years ago didn't think that housing cost problems were their problem. Wow, yeah, and, and isn't that always the way, like, the best, like, uh, innovative, late career, mid-career stuff starts with like, oh, I'm just choosing this little boring backwater. And then suddenly you're thrust into the spotlight. Uh, and, and certainly you are thrust into the spotlight right now and, the, and policy and zoning. So I think that's really fascinating thinking about the state and local. This is really a state and local challenge that we're talking about. And uh, and it feels like while everybody knows California has messed up housing policy for 50 years, uh, it feels like a lot of the rest of the country is uh, is like facing facing the issues, uh, the same issues now. And and maybe that's a a good uh, uh, like next question, which is 
what are the issues? What what are we like affordability? Sure. Um, you know, and even affordability in, as you say, Arkansas or Montana. Uh, but what are the right ways to say, if like we know how to stack rank, this is what America's facing. What are we facing? So the reason I got into housing, I was actually trained as a macroeconomist. And I, I started, I was looking at cost of living from a macro point of view. And the more I looked at it, the more I thought, wow, you know, you can, you know, I don't know, the U.S., for instance, has really bad sugar policy. We make sugar twice as expensive as it should be. We could fix that, and it would save the average household 20 bucks a year, right? That's, that's nice, but that's, that's couch cushion money. And then you look at housing, and you say, whoa, we could save the average household five or $10,000 a year. This is just a different scale. Why are we even putting these in the same category? And housing, so it's, it's the biggest item in, in most families' budgets, it's also connected to everything else, right? You can live anywhere you want and choose how much sugar you consume, right? That's, that's kind of separate from all your other decisions. But once you've chosen where to live, you've implicitly narrowed down your choices of job, school, recreation, friends, travel. So there's, there's almost nothing that we do. I suppose, you know, we're, we're recording this podcast from, uh, remotely, so we have communications now that let you do anything from anywhere online. But if you're talking about the real world, it's all tied into where you live. And so, you know, people call this the housing theory of everything. When housing's unaffordable, it spills into every other domain from, you know, the fact that working class people are fleeing California, which means that if you're trying to build houses in California, you can't find uh, tradespeople to do the work, which makes it a double whammy. Or if you're, uh, if you're, you know, thinking about Upward mobility, you know, can people who are born into the lower half of the income distribution get a good job? Well, it turns out that they can't live, they can't get an apartment to start that first job in a, in a New York or a Boston. And so they end up living, you know, in, in Cleveland or Atlanta where wages are a lot lower and they're not going to experience that same mobility. So you end up from, you know, climate change to property rights to education, everything else, you can tie it back to housing. And sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm a little bit of a conspiracy theorist, uh, but then I look at my own life and everything I do is connected to where I live. The housing theory of everything. It's, it's really true. And, it, and uh, we can certainly state that as a fact in, in our conversation here, like in this audience, we can talk about the housing theory of everything. And I think that resonate in a lot of ways. I think about my own experience. You know, I live in San Francisco and you know, there are a lot of tax refugees who leave California. And, uh, you know, what are you going to you know, sacrifice in terms of all the other things. And I haven't yet found the spot in the world where that makes sense to me. So I stay in San Francisco, you know, and, and so that I buy right. that uh, very, very clearly. Um, okay. And, and so the, uh, so that like housing is a, the big lever that we can, uh, that we can, we can move that uh, to impact people's lives. Uh, and so, um, you know, the things like construction and, you know, inventory and, and does like, does Montana have a, you know, an underbuilding problem in the same way San Francisco does, or, you know, what are the, what are the problems that, what are the things that are, when we look at it, you know, okay, sugar policy is lousy, uh, and it's lousy for these four reasons. What, what, you know, and I'm sure, uh, the American housing policies has a, a lot more, nuanced in that because it's also local. So, so what are, what are the big things that we're tackling? That's great. So let me break your question into two parts. So first, I think your audience is mostly people who know more than I do about the, the real estate industry, buying and selling and, and looking at products and that they're going to be way more sophisticated than me. I come from an economics background and one of the just starting point differences in the way that these two worlds look at housing is economists usually think about supply and demand as being the total stock. So it's every home that exists in the San Francisco Bay Area is part of the housing supply. So when, when economists say supply, we're talking about that kind of long run, are there places to live? And obviously, only a small number of those units are on the market at any given point. And so market participants are really focused on the, the sort of supply flow, what's available at the moment. So you can have, you know, in a healthy housing market, you'll have booms and busts. 
and there'll be times when that flow of supply is tighter or looser, a buyer or seller's market. But, you, but the, the fundamental difference between a healthy and an unhealthy market is that San Francisco, an unhealthy market, the stock, that permanent supply of housing is really low relative to the kind of long-term share of Americans who would like to live and work in the Bay Area. And so, you know, we, we, we've dealt with <laughs> quite a few fluctuations, right, over the last five years. And they haven't changed those fundamental underlying facts. And it's occasionally we need to be reminded, oh, yeah, just the fact that home prices fell 1% last month doesn't mean they're low, right? 1% of a million is still a lot. So, um, so that's the first, you know, just like a, a different mindset and, and maybe a different lens to look at things. And I have to remind myself to, to sometimes try to get into a practitioner mindset um, when I try to learn something new. But then getting to, to the, the, real, the real meat of your question. What is it that's wrong with the American housing market? And to me, the, the, the real fundamental long run thing that's wrong is that we've made it really hard to build new housing, primarily through geographic restrictions, what we, we usually call zoning. Sometimes it shows up in a different part of law that isn't zoning. It might be a, a green belt policy or conservation land, or it might be a subdivision ordinance or uh, you know, a unified development ordinance. We'll call it zoning for the sake of conversation. What we've generally done is said, we don't want to have more than such and such a number of houses. It might be zero, might be one per acre, four per acre, 12 per acre. We don't want to have any more housing than this on, on all this land. And if you do that in one neighborhood, well, it changes that neighborhood. If you do that across every metropolitan area in the entire country, it changes the country. And so where people live and where they can afford to live ends up being distorted by the kind of the aggregate impact of all these restrictions. And I don't have a good way, there's no, you know, one magic bullet policy, like if, if San Francisco only raised its height limit or something like that, it turns out that having done this now for 50 or 60 years, American cities have, you know, you can think of uh, grooves, right? So like you, you, you run the same wagon over the same trail enough times there's these deep grooves of this is how we know how to build. Builders who are trying to do products that aren't allowed go out of business. Insurers who you know, are, are looking at the market, they insure things that are usually built. Uh, local government officials, even if you change the law, they wouldn't even know how to evaluate a project that is just completely out of that track. So it actually turns out to be really hard. I think zoning is the, the sort of the, the original sin, but we shouldn't imagine that if we just change zoning, that the cart can go anywhere at once. It's actually going to take quite a bit to get that cart out of its ruts. Yeah, for sure. And you see that momentum in, in all kinds of places. You see it in, uh, and, and, I, and some of this we'll get into a little bit of this, these things later on with, with some of the shifts that are underway. Uh, and I, you just published uh, some work on the, the 50 markets that where things are starting to shift. And we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, I want to go back to your comment on the... Uh, on how we how we view supply, uh, and and yeah. so you know from an economist, supply is all the homes that exist. Uh, from uh, from a uh, a market price, it is uh, these are the homes that are for sale, and then there's actually a third view of supply that that we look into, which are the new listings in a given week. So we can watch the homes coming to market. And right now we can see inventory supply is up 39% from last year at this time. But the new listings in a given week are actually very low. And so what that means is that we have any marginal increase in demand, inventory falls, the, 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 that middle level of supply falls, and we get price uh, pressure right now. And it's one of the reasons that we focus on inventory and the new listings volume each week to understand what's happening in the housing market. So on though the every home question, uh, and because from, from, the, from the latter two, total inventory and new listings, we have a shortage. The shortage of homes for sale, normally there might be, uh, like in the last decade, there might be a 1.2 million single family homes on the market in the middle of July. Now there are 668,000 this week. Uh, so that's a shortage of homes for sale. Mm -hmm. Do we have a shortage of homes? The top level? Yes. Yes, we do? Yes. 
We do, and the, and the way we measure it is through price. So we just, we, you basically look at the price. You could say the price may be relative to the hard plus soft construction cost, which is gonna differ place by place, but not a huge amount. So if I say, well, it costs maybe 250 to $500,000 to build a new home in the US, but I see the prices in some places are 2 million. And I say, well, okay, even if we assume that it's, it's quite expensive to build 500,000, say, that, that reflects a massive shortage. And so I look at, we don't know perfectly what the size of that shortage is, but if we you know, take an estimate of the uh, elasticity of demand, then we can kind of get a ballpark of how many homes were short. And I think it's interesting, we've seen some different studies that estimate the national shortage from like of 1 million homes or 4 million homes or 20 million homes. Right. And it depends how you're measuring because you also get the sort of, well, the country's big. And so there's a big shortage of homes in, in the Bay Area, but if people move there, they'd be moving away from somewhere else, which would actually alleviate pressure in that place. Yeah, okay, so, so, by, so by looking at the fact that it costs 2 million bucks uh, for a house, but it's, it's a 800K to build or whatever, um, it, that indicates that there is a, there's a structural uh, shortage because if there if there wasn't that that purchase price would come down to the construction price there'd be roughly it would be much closer that's right now I, I think it would be really interesting to take the the kind of the week by week view and what would we, what would you get if you added that up over fifty years right there's going to be some gluts there's going to be some big shortages those should kind of you know cancel out over time I don't know do you get to the same number. Uh, or is it? Are these just so different, such different perspectives that they don't need to add up, and, and we shouldn't worry about it too? Yeah, much. and is the and isn't the 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 sale price? Isn't that at least um, at least uh, like partially influenced by the that middle level of supply, that that active inventory level of supply, which is low, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and it, and. It gets to another question I have, which is when we compare the U.S. housing market to other housing markets, we have different zoning and different construction and different those kinds of uh, uh, restrictions in other countries. Um, but we had big price run ups in a lot of the world over the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. uh, is that are, are we underbuilding everywhere in the world? Good question. So certainly in the major English speaking countries. Okay. So we, we share a lot of institutions and there's a sort of like, you can think of these places as like running the same computer code on different machines and they're, they're getting very similar okay. results. Um, and New Zealand is, is the, the one that has really broken away and have, they've started to bring prices down since they made major reforms. Very small country, so it's, it's easier to turn a small ship than a big one. And now in Canada, both candidates for prime minister are talking seriously about setting uh, major home building targets and um, you know, pushing really hard on localities to change their regulations to achieve those. So there's at least some sense, you know, and, and I, Keir Starmer, the new, the new prime minister of the UK, is talking about taking away local authority to say no to new developments. We'll see, you know, I, I don't wanna, you know, political pronouncements are, are uh, you know, maybe, maybe worth the air that they are spoken with, but uh, if those do mean something, we could see a real shift in the Anglosphere. In, you know, if you go to the whole world, well, then there get to be a lot more caveats and differences. And, um, you know, I, I sort of see you're pushing towards macroeconomic factors. Those do matter. You know, no one's, no one's saying that um, overall economic growth or the, the availability of money doesn't matter at all. But when I look at, you know, say, uh, and, and here's, here, I'll defend the, the, the large stock view. If you said, well, we experienced a market where inventory was above average in San Francisco, but below average in Memphis, I still bet that the home for sale in San Francisco, it might be lower than it usually is, but it's still going to be way more than the home in Memphis. And that reflects that kind of long term, structurally over 50 years, Memphis has roughly enough houses for the people who want to live in Memphis. The Bay Area doesn't. A short term shift is good. That's a, you know, a step in the right direction, 
but it's going to take a lot of steps to cover the distance between Memphis and San Francisco. Yeah, for sure. Okay, that's cool. I got lots of things that are coming up. Like, for example, so NIMBYism is universal, mm -hmm. or at least it's a, a, an Anglophile Western universal characteristic. Yes. And therefore, okay, all right, so that makes sense to me. Uh, I buy that. And then, um, and then in terms of like, you know, uh, supply San Francisco versus Memphis, you know, one I use, refer all the time, there's a stat that we track, uh, that we use because we're tracking inventory, tracking every home for sale in the country every week, that the, uh, the stat that I uh, have looked at, in fact, uh, almost 20 years ago when we were starting and, and the bubble was bursting, is uh, inventory per capita. So available inventory of unsold homes per capita. And, you know, we can look right now in, in Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County, which is several million people. It is, um, uh, you know, it's San Jose. It's, it's a tech, you know, high-end demographic. And there's, yeah. you know, a thousand homes for sale for several million people. If you go to Austin, same demographic, same, you know, it's, there's 10,000 homes for sale right. in Austin and, and, and it's a slightly smaller, uh, market. And, and so we can see, uh, we, we can see exactly what you're talking about. Like they, they build more in Austin, but there's also, uh, California property taxes are locked in forever. And so we hoard our real estate more in Texas taxes are higher. So it's a much more robust resale market. Things get more expensive that's faster right. to hold. And so they resell. Um, okay. So that's right. really interesting. That's uh, I love the, I'm, I'm writing down lessons already. It's terrific. Um, uh, so um, we've been talking about sort of underbuilding and therefore, and this shortage, a structural shortage of too few homes is really a, a function of underbuilding. Is that, is that what you'd call that? Yes, I was. I would say underbuilding, and and we're talking about a fifty-year problem. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a great book yeah. published in '79 called "The Environmental Protection Hustle," uh -huh. uh, and yeah. written about uh, the the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's kind of like its early steps into NIMBYism, and how neighborhood activists were, you know, bargaining down the size of each uh, new development. So something that had been planned for a hundred homes ended up being fifty, and you could see the prices going up accordingly because if you know the developer of course had to cover their land and infrastructure costs so you know this is not something that nobody saw coming it, it has been coming people have been talking about it and i think what's changed is maybe how deep into the market you know the, the how deep into the income levels the pain is reaching and therefore the political will that exists to do something about it right yeah, and, and you know we're in a situation now where you're in in political power and you realize your kids can't buy a home and mm -hmm. it becomes very acute, even though you have a lot of home equity and wealth, your, you know, your kids have to move to, to Arkansas or South Carolina or someplace. And, and like that, that's very noticeable. So I think that the tide is changing there. So, uh, which is the, the point of our conversation today. Um, uh, so, okay. That's right. Um, so, do you have a number on how you look at the total under underbuilding? You know that there's a big spectrum. Some people say we don't even we're not even underbuilt. Uh. I so I, I usually don't like numbers. Um, I, th I think of myself as theory driven rather than data driven because the data is going to change tomorrow and the theory will will, will stay sound. Okay. Um, I've seen I've seen you know two papers that I like. One that estimates it at four million and another at twenty. And I think those are both correct depending on how you ask the question. And what we need is a really, really large amount of building in the high demand places. So the high demand places need to build more than the total national deficit because some people are living in Memphis who would like to be living in the Bay Area. Right. And who would move there and get a better job and contribute more to their society, themselves, their family, if they could afford to live there and have that job. And so... You know, this is, again, why prices are more important. I, I really don't want the government, you know, the next president to come in and say, OK, well, we, you know, had our bean counters line it up and we decided there's like 6.27 million homes and we've assigned them equally to all the states. That's not going to work because then California will get, you know, a proportionate number. And that's not enough. California needs way more than a proportionate number of new homes. Boston needs way more than a proportionate number of new homes. And, you know, Iowa's probably fine. Yeah, true. And yeah, yeah. Right. So the only reason that prices are getting bid up in Iowa is that there's people who would rather live in 
Chicago or Austin or Miami, and they are instead buying houses in Des Moines, and that's enough to sort of you know push the push the prices over. The yeah, top. the way I've the way I've uh, described that in the past is is you know we used to build houses where people want to live. Now people want to live mm -hmm. where we build houses. That is exactly right. Uh, okay, so that's real. So twenty million is a really fascinating way to look at it because they are. Uh, in aggregate, maybe it's four, but if it's like where we people want to be, to be there optimized for their life uh, and their productivity and their creative contributions, we may be 20 million underbelt. That's a bigger number than I have uh, than I've considered before. That's really fascinating. Um, so this topic, it flows into affordability, of course. And um, and so right now we have. Prices are up, home prices haven't come down, mortgage rates are up, the com combination is, it creates the least affordable you know, payment in, in uh, probably 40 years at least, and, and maybe more. Mm -hmm. um, is there, what do we do? What do we do about affordability? Good question. So, like I said, there's deep wagon ruts. And the, the first thing we need to do is remove the fences so that somebody can even try to get the wagon on a new track, uh, right? So there's no point in telling insurers to do something different if it's not legal or builders to do something different if it's not legal. And some places have taken steps. So we're, we're seeing cities like Austin, Texas, right? They saw home prices in Austin for a few months were higher than in, in, in metropolitan level. Uh, metropolitan Austin were higher than metropolitan Washington, D.C., uh, briefly. And... They've had such an influx. They have a growing tech sector, really high quality of life and great culture. And they're growing up from being like a, a college, cool college city to being a major American city. Some growing pains there. They, they have taken some big steps. They cut their minimum lot size from about 6,000 square feet to I think 1,800. And they have slashed what they called compatibility requirements, which implicitly created a really tight height limit if you were anywhere near a single family house so you couldn't build multifamily unless you were far away from a neighborhood, which of course meant you couldn't build multifamily in places that are nice to live. And so they've cut those two requirements. Um, they're dealing with, they're lucky, right? They, they had a lot of downtown multifamily zones where a lot of multifamily was built. And so they've had rents drop by something like 10% from their peak, but they're still above where they were in 2019. So let's not get too excited, right? So it's a, you know, that's what a healthy market looks like. There's going to be booms and busts. But the bus follows the boom and you don't just boom and, and stay booming forever, which is what would have happened in, in L.A., right? And um, so Austin's a great example. We've seen cities all over the U.S. getting rid of parking requirements, which are a cost driver for uh, new multifamily, but also new single family uh, if, you want, if you have to build a, a four-car garage on every house. And, uh, you know, we're seeing states getting in on the act. And this is the, the study that you mentioned. Uh, it's called uh, Laying Foundations, Housing or Supply Reforms in 2024. And that's available on the Mercatus.org website. Uh, my, my colleague, Eli Kahn, is my research assistant. He did most of the work on this. I got to give him full credit. Uh, Eli's great. And he was really working hard to sort of track and synthesize uh, something like 300 bills around the country that were in state legislatures. A handful of states really uh, took the bit in their teeth this year, a couple of them after failing the year before, and have advanced major state level reforms, which could kind of nudge you know, a whole metro area out of these ruts. Um, but implementation, you know, that, that that's a big step and, and we got to see how they play. Right. So uh, Austin is good and some states are really jumping on it this year. Who else is a good example of doing good work? Well, so Denver, Denver, or Colorado at the state level is one of the one of the ones where the state took action. Governor Polis there, um, he, I think, thought this was going to be something he could easily get his party around last year and, and instead got, you know, ran into a stone wall. Uh, Republicans didn't want to play ball and suburban Democrats were like, well, we're not going to risk our seats over this. He came back this year with a, a slightly uh, more modest proposal, but the requirement now is for every Denver area suburb that has transit service to significantly uh, upzone to allow multifamily. They get to choose to some degree where it is and whether to do like moderate density over a large area or really high density right near the train stations, but they are you know, supposed to make these major changes. And if you see all of the, um, you know, cities in a, in a 
metropolitan area making this change together, you might really move the needle on that. And some builders would say at that point, okay, it's worthwhile for us to start developing new products and new models that fit in different contexts, not just the five acre site. Like let's think about the quarter acre site that was a old single family home, but now I'm allowed to build up to you know four stories and, and multifamily on there. What can I do with that site? There's no one doing that model in most cities now. And so if you want transformation, you got to think about some different business models. And then, you know, going, you know, in that direction, okay, what do you do on a small site? One of the reforms outside of zoning that's really gained traction this year, we saw it in, in five states, is taking steps toward allowing uh, what they call single stair buildings, which is very not descript, but it basically means instead of a double loaded corridor, long hallway, large site, uh, if you use higher quality fire prevention measures, so you don't need a second egress to maintain the same level of safety, can you go up to four, five, six stories and put two to four apartments per floor? Those are much more, much more family friendly. You know, it's more like a, a large condo, a place of, you know, a, you can live with your two little kids rather than um, the place you live while you look for a starter home. It can be your starter home. And again, we're in early stages on that. We'll see what the fire marshals say as, as the states study this and sort of do the implement implementing regulations. Um, but that's how most of the world builds apartment buildings. Like well, the US is quite exceptional in how we construct apartment buildings. And maybe we have something to learn from all these countries where there's far less fire deaths than here and, and we should be um, positive about that and not, not skeptical. So those are some of the areas where I see, um, you know, really promising change uh, at the state level. Yeah, it's funny that the, the stairway thing is, a, is such a fascinating legacy uh, of, of the 20th century, you know, where, you know, you have a tragic uh, apartment building fire, no, not enough exits, and, and, you know, that's so that we change the laws to require the exits. Uh, but, but meanwhile, the fire detection and suppression technology is moved way beyond, and we're building everything with, with fire extinguishers everywhere. And, you know, in a, in a building like that and uh, and, you know, our, our inspection processes are very high. And so those things are working. And so is right. the double stairway uh, like is that is that something that can go? And like that's a really fascinating uh, change. And, and um, you know, and I, I, like it's hard to imagine like any one of those solving our problem but in aggregate it allows us to build more and better and and build for the 21st century yeah that's right and and we need ultimately we need the you know the professions the industry to deliver right laws don't build houses and you know if i think about what do i what do i need to do as i talk to legislators what do i need to do to let builders do their job a big part of it is certainty and permanence right it can't be a well, we're going to have a, you know, a uh, impact fee holiday and let you permit a ton of buildings in one year. Um, somebody tried that. They got a lot of applications. I don't think those buildings are actually getting built. Everybody said, oh, okay, if it's free to do the application, I'll put the stake in the ground and then I'll do the, the numbers. Well, it turns out that when everybody else is building is a terrible time to yeah. build. Um, you can't get contractors. You know your property is going to sit on the market forever when it comes to market. So they didn't get followed through. And what you need is you need to make investment worthwhile, right? I, I want somebody to say, oh, it's worth investing in the, the capital equipment, training the workforce, orienting my career around whatever it is, building townhomes, building single stair buildings, um, you know, creating uh, commercial to residential conversions for a very long time. People, people don't do this as like a, a vacation, right? This is a, this is a career and we need to kind of respect that by saying, we're going to put the guardrails in so that you can have this career, whether you're a, the owner or, or a, an employee, and it's going to put food on your plate for 40 years. And that that's the kind of, it took us 50 years to get into this problem. It's going to take us a comparable amount of time to get out. And the only way is by convincing people that it's worth uh, staking their own time and fortunes on. And it's not just, it's not something you can just legislate. Right. Away. Right. Okay. So the, 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 Permit holiday. We, we don't want the the band aids are not effective, but the but but the okay. shifts are okay. Um, it brings up a couple other questions. One that's top of mind um, is a little left field. Uh, have you done any work with the land value tax, the the Henry George, uh, and, and is that is that something we should be paying attention to? 
I think it's overrated. Okay. Um, there's some there's some keen insights, and it's I think a, a split roll is a good idea where you have a higher tax on land than on property. But I don't think the idea that you should tax away the entire increment of land value, I think that's actually a poisonous idea because it prevents the redevelopment of land. Right? So if we say, hey, grandma, you're sitting on a parcel that's worth millions and millions of dollars, um, wouldn't you like to sell it and move somewhere quieter with all that money uh, so that somebody can build you know, a skyscraper there because it's downtown? But also, the taxes are so high that it's actually not worth anything. Right? So if, we, if you fully do a land value tax, you strip away all the land value, and grandma gains nothing from selling. It's painful for her to hold, um, but not that painful because the, the tax value is actually really low once you take the taxes into account, right? So if you put taxes into the equation for land value, you quickly make all land value the same. So I think there's, a, there's an insight there. There are also much easier ways to get the same value without ticking voters off. And voters actually get really ticked off when you do this because it feels unfair. It feels scary, yeah. Um, yeah, so like in Pennsylvania, this is allowed and it keeps getting rolled back because voters just like, they hear stories where like two people live next door and one of them happens to have like a deeper backyard and pays twice as much tax. And they're like, that's not fair. Like these are basically identical homes. And um, I think the, the way that Ohio has actually handled this really well is to allow uh, tax abatements on new construction. So, you know, the way that Walmart, like, uh, will come to a town and say, hey, give us a 15-year tax abatement if we move to your town. Well, how about instead of Walmart, you do that just for every anybody who improves or creates residential property? So um, a tax abatement for, like, I'm, I'm improving the property and I get my tax, as opposed to what happens in California, which is the opposite of that. That's the only time I get exactly. my tax. That's right, right. So California, California said, here's a good idea. Let's flip it around backwards so that it's an <laughs> That's extra <right>. value. <laughs> Uh, do we ever, are we ever going to get past Prop 13 in California? Uh, I think the only way out is by steps. So one would be making Prop 13 not apply to newly created property, uh, which appeals to everybody who already has their property because then they're like, oh, I, you know, I get the free ride. Um, but then you create this sort of unfairness wedge and that that's a leverage point in the future. And then eventually you say, well, okay, we'll let, we'll, we'll grandfather everybody in, but Anybody who, after you buy a home, you know, in 2035 or whatever, then Prop 13 doesn't apply anymore. And just sort of like slowly back out of it without hurting the people who are already bought in. Because you, I don't, you just, you're just not going to win something where you say, hey, everybody, would you like to pay $10,000 more per year in taxes? Um, and then maybe you also need to pair it with an income tax cut because income is great. We would really like people to uh, earn more, to be more creative, to work harder. Um, that makes us all better off. And so I think if they said, hey, we're not just going to do this so that we can spend more money, we're going to make this revenue neutral, uh, but we've, we've recognized how incredibly unfair and regressive um, yeah, incredibly. Prop 13. Yeah, for sure. You know, you get, you get in San Francisco, you know, a, a one, $2 million house next to another one. The, the one's been in the family for 50 years. They're paying $1,800 a year in property taxes. And next door, you bought the house yeah. for $2 million bucks. You know, you're paying 25000 a year or 20 or 35,000 for a year. And, and, right. uh, it's the same house. Um, yep. and, uh, so therefore you don't ever sell it. Okay. Um, I'm on that. I, I'm, I'm fighting on that Hill all the time. Uh, yes, it's, it's worth it. People, people should be convinced that this is bad and poisonous and exclusionary. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned, uh, so it's not just, you know, getting the permits done. It's actually getting the builders to build and, mm -hmm. um, and it brings up one of the uh, variables that I'm looking for better insight on, and that's immigration. So mm -hmm. I'm an immigration maximalist. Like I'm like, immigrants create wealth, more immigrants create more wealth, bring them in, like bring them all in. Uh, and, and I also am of the view that, uh, you know, uh, one of the reasons we don't build enough is because we don't have enough skilled trades people and we get most of those from immigrants. Uh, so right. we want to build more, bring more immigrants in. Uh, where does my take uh, fit into your view and what should I know better? The other, the other side of that, of course, is that, is that you know, immigrants mean population, means household 
formation means means uh, a, a more affordability. They need, they need somewhere to look. Yeah. To. So yeah. so where should I? How should I think about it? No, I, look, I think you're absolutely right that targeting immigration, whatever the level is, targeting it towards people who are going to thrive and contribute a lot when they get here um, would be a huge improvement, right? The idea that we're currently targeting towards people who are um, desperate enough to you know, pay a human trafficker to get them across the border um, or people who have family already here. Those are basically you know, the groups that have a relatively easy time coming to the US and then some H-1B visa holders, but not nearly as many as, as there's jobs for. That's not a great way to run a rodeo. And uh, it would be vastly better if we said, hey, you know, trade unions, tell us, you know, tell us who's your counterpart in um, sending countries. And, you know, let's absolutely bring people here who have passed the electrician license exam in another country and, you know, put them on a fast track with the union here to get them um, licensed. And I think we could immensely gain from that in terms of home construction and, and quality. I, you know, honestly... If you see construction around the world, the U.S. has some things to learn. Part of that is how you know we choose to do you know pine wood framing, which is obviously um, not an especially durable quality of building. But there's a lot of countries around the world which have great building traditions, and we uh, would absolutely gain from bringing in master builders who um, have done great work in in Europe or, or Africa or South America, and letting them do that here. Uh, we're a diverse country, and it's it's actually interesting to me when I go. Uh, especially to the Southwest, um, it seems like they're missing the, the, the heritages that ought to inform the way construction is done. And so, you know, if you're in, I don't know, like uh, New Mexico has a lot of restrictions that things have to look uh, Pueblo Revival, but they don't actually have to be Pueblo Revival. So they're building a, a pine frame house and then like, you know, slapping some um, finish on the outside and it looks terrible. It just doesn't fit at all. And there's so many places in the world where Americans come from, you know, from from middle, the Middle East, um, from uh, Central America, where you have a very similar climate and they have really interesting building traditions that work really well. Uh, I lived in, in a summer in Morocco, I was teaching English and lived in a, a uh, unair conditioned place, but it was so, the walls were so thick that it was always 70 degrees inside. And so you, like, there are ways to build for that climate that are actually delightful and comfortable. And instead they've, they've sort of taken like the, what worked, worked in, in Massachusetts um, and just copied and pasted it and, and you know, put, put a different finish on the outside. Like, yeah, I, I think we have a lot to gain um, regardless of the, I, you know, I, I, I have my own views on immigration. I, I'll, I'll keep those to myself, but like regardless of the numbers, um, the, uh, how we target it can be just vastly better. You don't have to keep those views to yourself. If there's something that, like, if, some, if there's a way to inform me, <laughs> I'm, I'm all. I, I, I largely agree with you, but I'll stick to my okay. name. <laughs> Great, uh, terrific. What about the uh, affordability side of that uh, argument? So, you know, when I talk about this, like, if I talk about this on Twitter, there are obviously the anti-immigration people who come out and say uh, affordability. If we bring in these people, aren't they driving up our house, housing costs? Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, I mean, so so imagine you bring somebody, allow somebody to, to enter the U.S. who doesn't work in the trades and isn't going to contribute anything to construction, right? So premise that. They have to live somewhere, so logically they're going to compete with the rest of Americans. But where are they competing? Now, if they're a Silicon Valley engineer, well, then, uh, yeah, absolutely. They're, they're part of the problem. Yeah. Um, but if they're, you know, staying in a, in a homeless shelter in New York, um, they're competing with an end of the market that is already um, looking at, low prices that they can't afford because they have no income, very low quality, often vacant units. Um, and I, I actually have an email that I need to get back to from uh, my old landlord in, in Rochester, New York, where I went to grad school. Uh, lives in a poor neighborhood and now has 50 Afghan families renting um, in, in houses that they own. So a lot of the places that poor immigrants are going are places precisely where housing is cheap and sadly where there aren't many jobs. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think the the ultimate answer is if we start building enough housing, the total number of immigrants we get isn't that big and you know, spread across a large country and uh, we'll be able to house them. Um, if we insist on not building anything, well, yes, then that's, you know, you're just cutting the pie into smaller slices. And so uh, not building creates a, a, a scarcity mindset. And you see this, I think most in, in Hawaii actually, it's where 
even people from the mainland are viewed, other Americans from the mainland, are viewed as immigrants and unwanted because they're coming in and they're cutting the pie slices smaller. And uh, that's a you know, really poisonous form of nimbyism that is what you get when you, when you have decade after decade of not building enough. Yeah, 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 okay. And, and the, other, the other element on that, as you pointed out, a lot of the immigrants, especially the, the low-end immigrants, uh, are coming because they have family here. And then the living arrangement is doubling up in density with that same family. Um, that's okay, right. uh, that's that's useful. I appreciate that expertise. Um, so so um, let's then talk about uh, uh, population over time. So one of the you know the basic assumptions we started with here is that we have underbuilt. Um, mm-hmm. We have underbuilt, and we've had like. Pretty, pretty dramatically, consistently growing population over the last uh, 200 years, and so, uh, and and in the last 50, we've underbuilt. The um, there are signals, especially if we clamp down on immigration, that that the uh, you know that population maybe has peaked or maybe not peaked, but, but certainly grows significantly slower. And, you know, as the boomers age out and die, like, you know, I, I'm Gen X, so like, I'm in the, I'm in the low population, I'm very sensitive to population swings, uh, you know, around the country. <laughs> Do you have a view, so like, are, are, the, are the assumptions of building and over or under building are they based on population trends of the last 50 years that maybe are changing now? So this is a really good question. I, I have had the privilege of talking to some of the, you know, the best urbanists in the field. And, and this is the question they don't know the answer to is how does society deal with population decline? Um, so there's a few things. So one is, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. The U.S. population is peaking, but it's going to take a while because that's happening mostly through low fertility it's going to take a while for the number of adults to start shrinking, right? So uh, I've got four kids and um, one on the way. And uh, so, you know, I'm doing my part, but, uh, but the reality is there's lots of people my age, not too many people my kid's age. And it's going to be when they're adults and later that we really start to see change in household formation because adults form households. Um, So that's just one technical note. We don't know. So I, I, I do worry, like, what does all this mean for Flint, Michigan, right? Or, um, you know, Mount Vernon, Illinois. If we build lots more housing in, in Washington, D.C. and Austin and the Bay Area and say, hey, everyone followed Salim's advice. They built more townhouses. They built more multifamily. And these houses are there. I think those will be occupied. The ones that are high demand now. So if, if your listeners are like, oh, my gosh, is anybody going to want to live in, you know, Santa Clara? Um, 50 years from now, yes, yes, you're going to be fine, you know, as long as uh, the other things stay under control. Um, but the places where old housing uh, is already not in great shape, you can get a kind of a death spiral, right, where it's not worth making major investments in the housing, so then it gets even worse, so then middle class families look at it and say like, well, I have an okay job here in Mount Vernon, but... I could move to you know a gorgeous new condo um, in Austin and pay the same or or not pay the same, pay more, but my wage is concomitantly higher. And then as you get your middle class people moving out, then you're left with retirees, people who work in resource extraction, kind of in intensively local industries, and then government, which is burdened with overhead costs of you know paying for vintage roads that are underused now and and retired. Um, personnel who, who need to be supported through their retirement. So there's real problems with population decline. And, and Japan is maybe the, the forerunner of this, where you, you look at rural Japan, they've got these, these kinds of problems. I don't know what that looks like in the U.S. Japan's different enough socially and, and economically that I don't know that we can just say we're going to have the problems they have. Um, I would love to see, you know, via, you know, we're, again, we're talking over uh, an internet connection thousands of miles apart. I'd love to see a, a constellation effect replace the superstar effects instead of a few superstar cities seeing more places. It's not going to be everywhere. It's not going to be every little village, but more places where there's a little enclave around a university um, or a, uh, a you know really beautiful historic town or something like that where you do get 
um, lots of high wage people clustering and kind of creating the economic cluster that then lets everybody else succeed, that lets the local government do a great job um, and have, have that tax base to work with. That would be really nice, but I don't know. And in, in a, you know, a declining population country just creates these urban questions that um, we really have never grappled with before. And I, I, that might be my my next major project in ten years. Okay, that'd be good to know. I, we will uh, we, I will be tuned in to to see. I, I you know have vague uh, apprehension about that, and I think there's a lot of assumptions in this uh, country that is predicated on growing population, and it's going to be fascinating to see which collapse. Uh, you know, we we assume our retirement grows by, you know, 6% a year. And like, what if that goes to zero, you know, as because with population, because, you know, there are those, those kind of things that are really, uh, that'll be fascinating to see, which are basically predicated on purely population growth. Um, uh, there are, um, so, so when we look at the longer term future, um, we've got, we're, we're dealing We've got we've got crisis level problems in housing right now in in a lot of ways. We have some shifts, uh, some policy shifts underway. Uh, what's give me a sense for you know what happens next and then longer term in terms of optimism? To get as do we have enough momentum to solve some of these? What do we what should we look at? Good question. I'll give you the pessimistic scenario Great. first. So imagine in the next three years, the U.S. goes into another deep recession for any reason. That's enough to take the edge off home prices, uh, to refocus all the policy people on things other than housing and zoning reform. And so we just don't make much more progress um, on the, the things that people like me are, are advocating for. And I have to switch what I focus my work on because no one wants to talk to me. Um, and then, and then the economy, you know, resumes growing, and we don't have a collapse because of population. That's the pessimistic scenario where we're essentially on the same track. And then I think you'll see, uh, you know, I think a really, really deep long-term level of inequality between cities, where I don't think that it's the death of, you know, Silicon Valley if they can't build affordable housing. Because the truth is, a club where only very successful people can live is you know, very delightful in a lot of ways, right? So like everyone you meet in Silicon Valley is going to be a very good programmer or, uh, you know, somehow serving that industry and it will just get more and more distilled. And if anything, the agglomeration effects from a highly distilled exclusive club of a few million people, that sounds like, a, you know, a recipe for immense creativity and, um, you know, they'll make themselves even richer and, and create even more demand to live there. Oh, you know, pushing the back office to, you know, Salt Lake City or, or Albuquerque or whatever. But the front office, the real creativity stays in the Bay Area. So I, you know, I don't, I don't think it kills the Bay Area. I don't think that it ruins, you know, Los Angeles, Boston, New York. But it makes them more and more exclusive clubs. And, you know, some people with low incomes hang on because they own property or because they have a place in, you know, existing public or, or deed restricted affordable housing. But ultimately, that's actually a small portion of the lowercase a affordable housing. Most affordable housing in our cities is just older housing and not the best neighborhoods, not, you know, not right next to downtown. And so um, you have to drive a little further for your commute, but it's a respectable place to live and you can, you can raise your family there. That eventually gets squeezed out as those areas become the only place where, um, you know, the next generation of young professionals can move. And then you get the Sun Belt continuing as it's continued as a very large, not especially high wage, um, you know, concentration of people who do want to live in a nice house and do want to live, um, you know, in a suburb and not in, you know, maybe the, the 1930s house in uh, St. Louis that they grew up in. Um, and then you'll continue to get the Rust Belt on its same trajectory. So I think, you know, it's, it's just more of the same. Um, just turn it up to 11, turn it up to 12. That's the pessimistic scenario. And maybe that's not so bad, right? America's a great place to live. I don't think we should overstate uh, how bad our problems are. The good scenario is that we um, do see these big ships begin to turn. And I, I think, I just can't emphasize enough, I don't think it's going to be quick. I think it's going to take a long time. I think there's going to be growing pains. Um, I think you'll see some of these superstar cities really get it right. 
I wouldn't be surprised if that's a you know a Seattle where they, they already seem to have a head start. Um, Washington D.C. already pretty good with really um, vigorous competition between the states around here, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and some of these areas will actually create uh, you know booming, pop, growing, rapidly growing population, but remaining high wage, high productivity cities. Um, and then hopefully some of the Sun Belt cities will be able to augment their, they're still going to sprawl, but augment their sprawl with higher density infill and build some great neighborhoods and towns so that people really feel like they have a place where they belong and they can, you know, gain some sort of multi-generational attachment to, um, you know, organically grown tight neighborhoods in a way that, um, I don't know, honestly, like the, this is the current subdivision model does not lend itself to. Um, I, I don't have a great prediction for California. I think California has so many things to fix. Uh, it could be a place with 200 million people. Um, it probably does not want to be that place, right? So if we get your immigration policy and my housing policy, um, <laughs> we might get to 200 million Californians. I don't know that that's going to happen because there's so many barriers and there's a lot of sacred cattle that need to be gored. Um, there isn't, there's some space, you know, south of San Jose for um, new greenfield development and you could do some really high quality dense development and, you know fit another hundred thousand people down there you're not going to fit tens of millions and uh the sea is there the mountains are there you're not going to build there um you would have to knock down a lot of people's houses to really change the core of los angeles or the core of um, san francisco and I, I i don't see the political will for that to happen um so my positive scenario for california is that the population decline reverses um and you start to see uh, you know, Hispanics and African Americans be able to move into California instead of out, and uh, people with working class incomes to be able to afford to live within half an hour of their jobs. Like th those would be really positive steps uh, for California, uh, but it's got to it's got to crawl before it can run. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, some of those on both the, the pessimistic side and 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 the optimistic side. I, I share. I see them. I see that experience. I see that that. Um, uh, that reinforcement of the the um, you know the the exclusivity happens around me all the time, and and on the one hand, it's like yeah, there's some really neat people around, very dense and really cool people. On the other hand, it's right. it's like hard to do a lot of basic things in, in life because of it. Uh, fascinating, fascinating uh, shift on the topic. Um, you mentioned in there real quick, and then. We'll start bringing it to a close. Uh, you mentioned Seattle as potentially a city that might get it right. Uh, what's what? Give me give me a few of those. And is that do you cover that in the in the paper that you mentioned the the research with? Um... No, in, in in laying foundations we don't because we're just doing state level policy okay. there, and and it's and it's a it's a twelve month look. So it's just what's happened lately. Uh, Seattle's been doing a number of things right for a few decades. So. Uh, it has allowed more density, not enough, but more density uh, and, and transformation within the city through its urban village model. So it has a bunch of kind of urban villages scattered throughout the city. Um, the premise is not that you're going to live and work in the same place, but that those places can be high density and uh, have the kind of like commercial uh, core and then, you know, apartments uh, above and around and in the back streets around. Uh, so that you can really get a neighborhood feel. That's been able to soak up some of the demand. They've also allowed those single stair buildings that we were talking about. So they are the one, the one city in the U.S. with a really proven model. And I guess two, if you count New York, but New York is a very different built style. Uh, Seattle seems to me like the one that would translate best to other U.S. cities. So you are getting those kinds of buildings in these these um, replacing single families in these uh, these um, urban villages, and. You know, physical the, the physical geography. Um, all, as with many West Coast cities, there's there's a lot of water and a lot of mountains nearby, and so Seattle, um, you know, planners have not been able to just say, well, we'll just you know, it'll just go one more mile out. Um, they they recognize they're going to run into the mountains real soon, and so there's been some quality there, and I think the 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 quality of the political discourse as well. Um, there's a strong environmental turn, and an understanding there, and and also I think this is really interesting in Red State, Montana. We had really the same dialogue where people get it that if you don't build in the cities, you are going to build in the countryside. And that the way to preserve the wilderness is to let your cities be cities. And I, I think it's really interesting that, you know, deep red Montana, that was the message 
that Republican voters and legislators responded to, like, yeah, Governor Gianforti's plan, this was the, you know, the 2023 legislative session, uh, Governor Gianforti's plan to really limit local zoning and, and force cities to accept more density is because we want to preserve the rangeland. We want to preserve the mountains and the Montana way of life. And that's, that's kind of a, a, a Rockies and Northwest value uh, that because they're relatively new places, uh, they do understand that, that their wilderness is a value and, and they want it to stay close. And the way to do that is to let more people in. The okay. Sense. That is a terrific view with a, with a positive for Montana. Uh, yes. And so that's great. I, I love to hear that. And, and, and that paper that, that laying foundations is the name of that paper. And we'll, we'll do a link for that. And, and it, so it, it's documenting the 50, I think you called it 50 up from maybe 30 a year ago, places that are uh, uh, doing good Bill, work. Bills enacted. What's that? So it's 50, 50, 50 bills enacted by state legislatures. 50 bills. And, uh, and so 50 bills that are that are doing good work to increase density, to fight things like affordability. Uh, it's up from 20 to or 30 the year before. 30, from 30, yeah, 30 last year. So, 30, so we had 30 bills that were enacted last year. And this year, um, so far, it's been 50 bills in, in 20 states. Okay. Um, that is terrific. We'll make sure people can see it. It's actually really um, uh, um, readable. I was, you know, it was read it the other day and it's like, you, know, you can, you're, you know, so it's sometimes they can be a little, the academic papers can be a little dense, but that one's, it's, it's great. It's very yeah. clear, very readable. It's nice. Good work. Um, uh, thank you. Salim Firth, thank you so much for your time today. It's been really insightful. It's exactly what I wanted to get uh, uh, resolved. Um, you're on Twitter. Uh, where, where else can people find you? Twitter, LinkedIn, uh, and then, you know, the Mercatus.org website. I also write uh, as a blogger occasionally for Market Urbanism. For which? For what? Market Urbanism. Market Urbanism. Okay, yes. Uh, and we'll provide those links. Yeah, the Mercatus Center obviously does a lot of free market uh, research in the world and, and has some great content that comes out of that organization. So that's a, it's a cool, cool spot. Thank you so much for your time today. Everybody, this is the Top of Mind podcast. And if you enjoyed the conversation, do you like getting geeky with me on the housing market? Uh, I certainly appreciate the listen, but also like give us some five star reviews on wherever you get your podcast because that helps other people find us and participate in the conversation like we had with Salim today. And we will be back very soon with another episode. Thanks, everyone.